Apocalyptic Gospel Podcast, where we explore the gospel that Jesus' earliest disciples heard and what the last several decades of historical studies have clarified about this first century Jewish message. Welcome to the Apocalyptic Gospel Podcast. I'm Josh Hawkins, and I'm here today with Bill Schofield and John Harrigan. Hey guys, how are you? Anything new? Doing good. Good. Doing good. Just talking about how Bill has no uh, rhythm. He can't clap. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Irish. Yeah, yeah. So it's an Irish plague. Yeah, <laughs> it's an Irish. <laughs> we save we save the world, but we can't clap. No. We applaud things before we start recording. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> For all the forty somethings, we reference the jerk and Steve <laughs> Martin trying to keep rhythm. <laughs> On his adopted <laughs> black parents' porch. <laughs> it's just some, uh, if, if, some classic humor right there. Yeah, if, <laughs> if you're not familiar, go and uh, go search for it on YouTube and you'll laugh along with us. Don't watch the whole movie. I don't need anything or anyone except <laughs> this lamp. <laughs> Uh, well, listeners, thanks for joining us again this week. Before we get into the material for today's episode, we just want to remind you about our website, apocalypticgospel.com. And we've got some goodies up there, including a list of resources, books, and articles, and documentaries on the subject of Jewish apocalyptic. And you'll also find a contact form there. Uh, many of you have taken advantage of that already. And so if you have a note of encouragement or a particular question on the material we've been covering on our podcast, Make sure you submit it there, and we'll do our best to answer it, the most common ones at least, in our upcoming um, series of Q&A episodes, which we've already done several, so go back and uh, you can find those on our website as well. Also, you'll find a donate link on our website. Our podcast is donor-supported, and there is a monthly cost for the hosting and distribution service that we use, so that's a great way to sew back into the podcast uh, if you've been encouraged or strengthened by it. And finally, go ahead and leave us a review and a five-star rating on whatever podcast platform you listen to us on. That really helps with the algorithm um, to kind of get the word out even more. Well, guys, let's continue our discussion today about the kingdom of God. Um, the last several episodes, we've been developing the theme as a first century Jew would have understood it as the Messianic Davidic kingdom that's going to be established by God eschatologically on the day of the Lord. And so we spent one of our episodes discussing the theological history of the kingdom. And last week, um, we worked through three major ways from passages in the Gospels that often are used to support realized or inaugurated eschatology, as if it had arrived in some spiritual sense already, the kingdom particularly. And that was through passages that say that the kingdom is at hand, like Matthew 3 and Matthew 4, um, to say that the kingdom has come upon you from Matthew 12 and Luke 11, and that the kingdom is within you from Luke 17. And we saw, I think, from the context of each of those passages that Jesus and John the Baptist are actually talking about the complete opposite of realized inaugurated eschatology, right? Like, they're actually indictment against non-apocalyptic eschatology. And in fact, in some cases, Jesus and, and John are saying the Pharisees are not apocalyptic enough. And so to support that, we walk through some passages from the prophets, as well as um, some aspects of the Greek verbal aspect, uh, Stanley Porter, and even a little bit of history, like with the Maccabean revolt. Um, just the idea we supported was that God alone is going to establish the kingdom that was promised to David by his own power on his day, and the strength of the flesh will play no part of it. And so if you missed last week's episode, Go back and have a listen before you continue with this one, because things hopefully will make more sense that way. But for today, we're going to talk about the parables of Jesus from the Gospels. The parables about the kingdom are often spoke of um, in in so many ways in strong support for realized eschatology, that the kingdom had already arrived in some spiritual way through the ministry of Jesus or through the activity of the Spirit or something. And so we hope to show you today that the parables are actually best understood within the context of first century Jewish apocalyptic eschatology, and that Jesus was not giving new information or redefining anything through them. And the issue really was how someone would respond. Um, how 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 is... Uh, someone beckoned to uh, respond to the message of John and Jesus um, by the parables. Uh, and, and that's really what's going to be brought out. So let's spend a little bit of time talking about how the parables are usually understood, either um, by modern scholars or ancient scholars, um, you know, or even in popular culture. How are the parables typically understood, guys? Yeah, I mean, just in a general sense from 
from the early Gnostics and the Nag Hammadi Library and uh, the Alexandrian school in origin, uh, the the parables are understood as some kind of spiritualizing or changing of uh, the Jewish narrative, and uh, and that plays right through most of church history until the modern era when it uh, the parables really become a, a, a real focus to justify uh, realized eschatology. And the in a broad sense, I think modern kind of academic studies, uh, they view the sayings, like the particular sayings that we talked about last week, I think of it like a like a tent. They, they view the sayings of the kingdoms at hand, it's come upon you, it's within you, uh, are kind of like the tent poles. And then the parables are kind of the covering that, that they're the glue that hold the whole schema, the theological schema or system of realized or inaugurated eschatology together for this transformation of uh, Jewish apocalyptic hope. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, yeah I remember a couple episodes ago we... We talked about the the history of the subject of the kingdom of God and how it's been applied and studied in the academic world, particularly in the West in the last hundred years. And one name that came up, which is very influential um, directly and indirectly in the way we see the parables today, is uh, C.H. Dodd. And C.H. Dodd, of course, was the one who wrote... Uh, his book, Parables of the Kingdom of God, or, or Jesus' Parables of the Kingdom of God, and uh, explained that these were primary evidence that Jesus taught a realized eschatology, that Jesus taught that the kingdom had already arrived in a spiritual sense. And the real mystery was that he was explaining that that those who get it understand that the kingdom was mysterious and it was spiritualized. And so, consequently, the way he did this was he explained the parables were all Jesus speaking mysteriously about his own ministry and his own day. And so, like, the parable of the sower is response to Jesus' teaching. Um, there's and, and he interpreted all the parables in this way. They were all, they were all just... Uh, so the, the, uh, likewise, the parable of the pearl means that the kingdom is accessible now. Jesus, that that was a, the core of his teaching, and so, and then you might remember Jeremiah's from the conversation about demythologizing the, uh, the the apocalyptic aspects of the kingdom of God and and of the various subjects in the gospel. Well, he does the same thing to the parables, and so according to Jeremiah's, the parables, even though originally they were probably spoken by the historical Jesus's warnings. They've now been transformed into encouragement. So what we have in the Gospels are all encouragements, not quite like Dodd, who said that they were all speaking of the ministry of Jesus, highlighting that the kingdom had already come, but rather it was a process of realization that Jesus was trying to explain, that the kingdom is kind of always coming. And, uh, it's, and they, were, they were essentially teachings of how it works. Yeah, yeah, and... It's interesting because now, you know, from the Dodd and the Jeremiah era, we move forward a little bit and we talk, we could even mention a, a more modern name, um, Craig Blomberg, who teaches at Denver Seminary today. And along with other modern evangelicals, they don't like the, the full on pendulum swing that Dodd and Jeremiah made about the parables, uh, and about, um, what was happening related to the kingdom and these things. And so they would say, I mean, for instance, this is a quote from uh, C- Craig Blomberg's book called Interpreting the Parables. He says, C.H. Dodd so emphasized the crisis nature of Jesus' own ministry that he interpreted Judgment Day to be present whenever people responded to Jesus. Traditional Christianity has often gone to the other extreme and linked judgment exclusively with the second coming of Christ. Blomberg says, probably both poles need to be embraced. And this is the standard position of modern evangelicalism in, in so many ways, right? Kind of Classic. flowing from one pendulum swing to the other and saying, no, we want to take a nice, happy position in the middle where we can say, well, it's already and it's not yet. And it's kind of both. And it's some of a little of this and some of a little of that. And um, I, I 
yeah, I, I don't know if that's necessarily the most helpful way to look at it either. Yeah, I, I think it's you, you end up it's it's not really helpful in my opinion to put it on some kind of spectrum. Right. We, we talked about this right. kind of in the, <laughs> a couple episodes ago of just putting it on the basis of present and future already not yet isn't uh, the spectrum should be the presumed worldview, Jewish apocalyptic versus a radical transformation. Yes. And uh, that should be how kind of the spectrum of how much change in the underlying assumptions and expectations is happening. Indeed. And, uh, you know, we kind of in, in us three in this podcast generally fall on the side that Jesus and the apostles uh, didn't seek a radical change, but generally held those expectations and that the thrust of their ministry is a revivalist thrust of the Jewish hope of the time rather than a revolutionist or, or uh, transformation kind of uh, preaching and teaching. And so, uh, you know, Blumberg is his book on the parables, interpreting the parables has kind of become a textbook on the subject. And it kind of represents how uh, evangelicals have taken that position. And, and, but what it does is it radically transforms the Jewish apocalyptic hope. Uh, and it, it's kind of a, it flows out of Dodd's work and, uh, and how that plays out as far as kind of at a practical, um, a popular level is that it, it just propagates more of the common misunderstandings or misconceptions about the parables that basically, you know, the Jews had this kind of false ethnic nationalistic hope that Jesus had to correct with these rudimentary parables uh, to introduce this new spiritualistic and universalistic nature of the kingdom to whatever degree, whether it's, you know, more or less. But there's some sort of the purpose of the parables is fundamentally to uh, is to teach new information or, you know, just a kind of a generalistic uh, teaching existential about how God is and, and the way God's sovereignty functions, sovereignty being the definition for the kingdom rather than the messianic. So, so this is kind of how it trickles down to the popular level is that the parables are understood as the Jews were, were dumb. They didn't really understand God or redemptive history. And Jesus had to teach, use these kind of stories, these parables to correct their understanding, which I think is really a, a fundamentally wrong approach to the parables in general. And it paints a, uh, uh, a very slanted picture of of Jesus' teachings. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that, John. And I think a lot of that fundamental misunderstanding has to do with Jesus' mission uh, and why he came the first time and what he was doing the first time he came. I mean, I think of a passage like Luke 12, verse 51, where Jesus says, don't think that I came to bring peace on earth. I came to bring a sword. And, and uh, so many of the themes that we see developed throughout the Gospels is Jesus, in essence, bringing division <laughs> to, to the nation of Israel, exposing the heart, exposing who is righteous and who is unrighteous, who yeah. uh, who is repentant and who is unrepentant. You know, even going back to Luke chapter 3 with John the Baptist, and John saying that the one coming after him is going to baptize with the Holy Spirit and the fire. He's going to gather the wheat into his barn and the chaff he's going to burn with unquenchable fire. And and the coming of Jesus would expose the heart uh, of the Jewish people, to and, and he was there to reckon with them. And so I think with that as one of the, the big foundational pieces to understanding the ministry of Jesus— we can come to a passage that develops all sorts of the parables, Matthew 13, and we can specifically see why Jesus would say, he says, here's why I'm speaking to them in parables, okay? And and this is Matthew 13, verses 10 through 15. This is Jesus speaking, and he says, the disciples came and said to him, why do you speak to them in parables? And Jesus answered them, to you has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but to them, meaning to the those outside or to the crowds, it has not been given. For the one who has, more will be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. Verse 13, this is key. Jesus says, this is why I speak to them in parables. Because seeing, they do not see. And hearing, they do not hear, nor do they understand. 
Indeed, in their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled. That says, and now Jesus quoting Isaiah 6, You will indeed hear, but never understand. You will indeed see, but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull, and with their ears they can barely hear, and their eyes they have closed. Lest they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and turn, and I would heal them. Okay, and so... I think this is so important to see the quote of Isaiah 6 and why Jesus is quoting Isaiah 6 to say, hey, even in Isaiah's day, the message was, Isaiah, go and speak to this people who have strengthened their will and hardened their heart against me. They're not repentant. Their uh, their, their response toward the, the preaching and toward the message of the day of the Lord, of the day of judgment, was, eh, not a big deal. We're fine. We're good. And the same thing was happening in Jesus's day. And so he says, this is why I'm speaking to them in parables. Yeah, that's right. That you know, it's a, it's a, it's an easy one to forget when you're reading. Um, that it, it basically what Jesus is saying and citing Isaiah six is that this is a covenantal dynamic that's taking place. Yeah, that this is that this is a dynamic of of it's a judgment dynamic on the, a large number of the Jews in that generation because of their hardness, and so. Isaiah 6 was God calling Isaiah to proclaim the judgment, but he was warning him, but, I, but they're already hardened. Yeah. Like, covenantally, this is, this is how it works. Like, you read Deuteronomy 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, and, and there, there comes a point where God actually gives their minds over to depravity so they can't perceive the truth, yeah. not because he's done with the covenant, but because he's essentially saying, um, th- this this generation, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna deal with this for the most part. And in every generation, there are, there's a righteous remnant of of Jews, right? Like, you know, you have Daniel and Ezekiel and, and Jeremiah in that generation, of course. But uh, but generally, Isaiah spoke of the generation, and so he was he was using that same language to highlight that dynamic, and so. What the parables would have done in light of that dynamic is expose hypocrisy yep. in Israel amongst the uh, amongst the descendants of Abraham. And so the, the point of the parables was one was to expose pride, was to uh, was to was to basically reveal these things that he was saying so that the humble and the repentant could hear. But the pride in those who were resistant to God in their hearts would be more resistant still. Yep. And so that's why he highlights, this is why I speak to them in parables, and he quotes Isaiah 6, which Isaiah 6, like I said, is talking about this covenantal hardening, and uh, he's just simply playing out the same thing there in Matthew 13 and, and, uh, and, to Mark 4, and in Mark 4 and, and yep. in Luke. Yeah, and I, I think just that basic orientation is key to appreciating the parables because the assumption is is that the parables are uh, spoken for believers primarily when in reality this the like you said bill the the parables are spoken against unbelievers against or those that are hardened or whatever yeah who claim to see but they actually don't who claim yeah. to yeah. hear uh the the word right. of the prophets, etc., but they they don't hear, and so the parables are spoken as a divine strategy to kind of break the hardness of pride and pretense and hypocrisy, and and so this is <clears throat> you know this is the this is the mystery of the kingdom. So in modern studies, the mystery of the kingdom is viewed as realized eschatology. Uh, so, like uh, George Ladd, he in his uh, he had a, one of his early papers that got published uh, in the Journal of Biblical Literature in the late fifties called uh, "Why Not Prophetic Apocalyptic." That was kind of one of those things in his career that kind of was a turning point. Someday I'll write a paper called "Why Not Jewish Apocalyptic," but he, <laughs> his paper was "Why Not Prophetic Apocalyptic." 
And uh, and basically, he said, you know, that the prophetic literature is the ideal. And he he said the prophetic literature, you see it in inaugurated eschatology and the prophetic literature, and that the apocalyptic movement kind of went off the rails and that Jesus and the apostles were correcting back to this kind of idea of an inaugurated eschatology as seen in the in the prophetic uh, literature. Anyway, so his he really focuses in on the parables and he says, the very core of his message about the kingdom of God is that the powers of the future eschatological reign have entered into history in advance of their apocalyptic manifestation and are at work now in the world in a hidden form within and among men. This is the mystery of the kingdom. Um, and so that gets translated both ways, mystery or the secret of the kingdom. And what that does, in effect, is the, the mystery is a Gnostic reality. It's a secret, uh, uh, it's a secret, uh, uh, knowledge that is being revealed right. that right. only those that can kind of apprehend it, uh, can understand. And I would say that the mystery is a moral reality. It's morally based. It's the mystery of iniquity that the first will be last and the last will be first. Jesus tags this saying at the end of a number of parables because the point of the parable is to reveal the hypocrisy of those who seem who, who seem to be first in this age, the leaders, the scribes, Pharisees, that are they kind of are presumed that they will inherit the greatest glory in the age to come, but they'll actually be last. Yeah. Yeah. And the last in this age, the sinners, prostitutes, those who are on the margins who are following Jesus, they're viewed as last, you know, in this age in the coming glory. They'll actually enter the kingdom of God ahead of those who are first. And so the first will be last, the last will be first. And this is really the core of the mystery uh, of the kingdom in a, in a moral yeah. sense. Yeah, and this is why I think Jesus would say to you, it has been given to know the secret or the mystery of the kingdom. Um, and you know, this is why he says to his disciples, that's what he says to his disciples directly, uh, because precisely his disciples were repentant. They were humble, unlike the Pharisees. They weren't engaged in this, this hip- uh, hypocritical way of living and, and thus thinking, okay, well, I'm certain to inherit the kingdom just because I'm doing X, Y, and Z, and I'm a descendant of Abraham, and I'm good. I pray and I fast. Uh, I'm not like right. this, the tax collector over here, you know. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And and I think this reminds me of a passage in Mark chapter 4. Right at the end of Mark 4, um, Mark makes the comment, this is right after he's kind of been going through a whole bunch of the parables. And uh, this is Mark 4, 33 and 34. Mark says, with many such parables, he spoke the word to them as they were able to hear it. He did not speak to them, meaning the crowds or those outside, um, without a parable, but privately to his own disciples, he explained everything. Okay, and I think this is such an important passage. This is Mark 4, 34. It's such an important passage because it means that the disciples were not confused as to the meaning of the parables. Right. They didn't have to go, oh, okay, well, I, I guess now I'm understanding that this is now a, a spiritually inaugurated, um, realized kingdom. It, it's happening now through Jesus's ministry. All the, the things that, you know, Ladd and Jeremiah um, and even modern evangelicals tend to do today with the parables that the disciples weren't confused about the meaning of the parables. And I think it's so important. This is kind of referring back to an episode that we made, uh, back when we went through the book of Acts and looked at Acts chapter one. Um, and, and I think if you recall, when we looked at Acts chapter one, the disciples had a question for Jesus saying, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And I think that it's important to see that the parables and Jesus's explanation of the parables informs their question. In Acts 1, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? They weren't thinking, okay, now we understand the parables in some sort of uh, inaugurated or realized way, but they were going, okay, Jesus has affirmed Jewish apocalyptic, he's affirmed the Torah and the prophets uh, and, and affirmed the covenant, and they're going in Acts 1, oh, okay, well, you're the Messiah, we believed it from day one, you're now risen from the dead, are you going to do the Jewish eschatology thing now? 
<laughs> Are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And so, right. as we said before, back in that episode, Jesus doesn't correct their expectation, though he does correct the timing of the kingdom's establishment. He doesn't correct their expectation. And I think it's so key to see the connection between the disciples understanding the parables because Jesus explained them to them and their question in Acts 1, that they did not see the parables as some sort of uh, redefinition or reimagination of Jewish eschatological expectation. So with that said, um, guys, let's talk about some of the parables. Let's jump in to, well, Matthew uh, has a whole bunch. Um, we'll talk about some Lucan parables. Let's just Let's go back and forth a little bit. Let's talk about some of the parables and what is it that we see in terms of the general aim, the general focus of these parables, and then let's work through a few of them and look at some of the details. Yeah, so so generally speaking, the the goal and the aim, the like the the question of how you frame them, the the has to do with what what the purpose of the of the parable is, right? And generally, if not exclusively, the the parables are eschatologically oriented, and they're focused on the response of the listener. They're they're focused as a warning to invoke a response if they have a heart to hear. So a good example is uh, Matthew 7. In Matthew 7, uh, you, if you grew up in the church, you know it from Sunday school, but it's a terrible Sunday school message because it's a really <laughs> it's a really scary one. It is. So it's the, super scary. <laughs> <laughs> so Matthew seven is the the parable of the two builders, right? And and the one who builds on the sand, and the one who builds on the rock. And and the rain fell and the floods came. And I'm in Matthew seven. And the winds blew and beat on the house, but it did not fall, for it had been founded on the rock. So all of that is, like, all of this is apocalyptic imagery for the end of the age and for the things that are coming in anticipation of the kingdom's arrival. And so the, so the point, or sometimes with the day of the Lord. And so the point is the guy who prepared his life for the day of judgment and the day of the Lord, his house will remain after the day of the Lord. And yeah. the guy who didn't, his house will not remain. Yeah. So it's actually really simple and straightforward if you just understand the aim of what they're saying. Yeah, Bill, I mean, this is just exposing again the, the idea that Jesus came to divide and to expose the response of the heart, who was repentant and who was unrepentant, who had already turned their heart and inclined their ear towards God. And I think of even at the beginning of the Gospels, you get people like Simeon and Anna um, and, and the ones who are looking for the redemption of Jerusalem, looking forward yeah, to the establishment yeah. of God's promises in the covenant. These kinds of people are presented even in Luke's Gospel, which we'll talk a little bit about the Luke and parables in a bit. But even at the beginning of Luke's Gospel, this division, you know, between who is wise and who is foolish, you know, and, and, um, uh, just beckoning the right response um, from the people who will respond appropriately and who will not respond appropriately. And this is, again, um, what the parables are all about. Yeah, I, and I think the the parable of the sower is particularly important just because in, in Mark 4, Mark 4 actually records that Jesus said, if you don't understand this parable, how will you understand all of the parables? So right. the parable of the sower is particularly, you know, Jesus, however it's handed down in the various, you know, synoptic gospels, uh, either way, it stands at the beginning usually of various parables told. So this one seems to have a particular importance, and the parable of the sower is all about the response. It's not about what the kingdom is. It's yeah. about how people respond to that kingdom. Yeah. Some don't respond at all, like the seeds on the road. Some respond with joy, and, oh, this is awesome, but then realize that it, it runs countercurrent to everything in this age, and that current comes against you. It doesn't matter who you are, where you are, at some point— it comes against you, and it. I've found in my own life that that my struggle is more with the the seed in rocky soil rather than the seed in the thorns, because everybody in the West identifies with the 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 seed in the thorns and and the weeds, <laughs> yeah, yeah. which I no doubt I have that, but. But my own struggle throughout, you know, last 15, 20 years has been how do I keep 
a joy. How do I continue to receive life and joy from this hope as first century Jews held it? And uh, in the academy, it's the the answer is you don't. It's it's not something to receive joy from. It's actually an embarrassment, or it's just something historical that you leave behind. But how do you continue to draw life from it and set your hope in it with a whole heart? Uh, and of course, the West, you know, the seeds and the thorns and and weeds. Well, this life you're just consumed by. You have to keep up and make money and and reputation and blah blah blah. It's it's the hamster wheels that continue to go, but. Those who respond, believe it, and respond with a whole heart. Well, those will those will produce, a, you know, a, a, a harvest thirty, sixty, hundred fold. And so, the the issue is about the response, not about the what the meaning of it is. Okay. Yeah, John, and I think when we think about another parable, um, like the parable of the wheat and the tares, or the wheat and the weeds, and uh, you know, again, just keeping in mind that these parables are focused on the response and they are eschatologically focused. I think that um, generally when we look at the parables of the kingdom, again, if we keep in mind that these are focused on beckoning the right response as God has sent the Messiah to divide Israel the first time, and then they're focused on how one would inherit the age to come and how they're responding to the message. This is the easy one, um, the parable of the wheat and the tares, because both wickedness and righteousness will grow together uh, until the end of the age, as Jesus says, verse 30 of Matthew 13, let both grow together until the harvest. And at harvest time, I will tell the reapers, gather the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. And, you know, Jesus goes on to explain this parable just shortly after that. Um, there's a couple of other parables in between that we'll hit. And I think it's so important that we see that Jesus explains this parable of the wheat and the weeds. And because his disciples, Jesus is privately, again, he goes away from the crowds and comes into the house and his disciples came to him and said, explain to us this parable. And he says, okay, well, the one who's sowing the seed is the son of man and the field is the world. The good seed is the sons of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one and the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is is the end of the age and the reapers are angels and just as the weeds are gathered and burned with fire so it will be at the end of the age the son of man will send his angels and they will gather out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all lawbreakers and throw them into the fiery furnace in that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father right and so again eschatologically oriented beckoning the response in terms of is someone hypocritical? Is someone repentant? And based on their response, how they will inherit Jewish eschatology. And again, a, a, a affirmation of all of the apocalyptic themes in Jesus's explanation of this parable of the wheat and the tares. And, and also aimed at unbelievers. So yeah. Matthew 13 being a following Matthew 12, where Jesus is getting attacked by the Pharisees and the Pharisees are literally scheming on how they're going to kill him. And so Matthew 13, why do you speak these parables? Well, I speak them to those outside who say yeah. they hear and see, yeah. but they don't. Yeah. And so the the wheat and the tares, as that's being heard, if there's Pharisees present, I assume, then they're hearing that going, I, he thinks I'm the tear. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm the religious yeah. leader. I'm the one who knows. I'm the one who knows the covenants, who knows the hope, who keeps the law, who fasts and prays. I'm the one who's going to inherit. But he is saying that I am the weed that is growing up that's going to be uprooted yeah. and cast into the yeah. fire. And so I think in all those, the, the, the negative overall tone of it has to you know, be kept in mind. Yeah, that's good. I also like this that, that parable in particular because it also emphasizes another big theme in the parables, which is the which is basically revealing that it's God's plan to delay the coming of the kingdom and allow wickedness to grow. Yeah, which means the sons of the kingdom are actually going to suffer. Yep, which actually yeah. just reiterates Jesus' original message to begin right. Like, right. If you want to be my disciples, you got to 
deny yourself, take up your cross, accept martyrdom, and you're going to have to follow me. Yep. And so many of the parables just kind of reiterate, no, God has ordained the growth and maturity of wickedness, and it's going to be costly for the righteous to, to you know, throughout this age. And that's, that's just the setting. And that's God's ordained it, and then at the end of the age, it's gonna it's gonna happen just like the expectation you guys know. the The chaff will be burned with unquenchable fire, and the and the righteous will be raised. And so I love how it, just in a in a parable form, it, at the same time, it strikes right at the heart of that that uh, that zealotry hope in in uh, the community of Israel as well, and just saying, no, God has ordained this period. And he's going to test the righteous, but it's not going to go on forever. And God is going to vindicate and and uh, bring about, like John said, the first and the last, and the last will be first. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, and I, I remember David Pawson used to say, you know, the faithful are not uh, to be about the work of weed pulling mm-hmm. in this age. Yeah, and uh, I think that has <laughs> been because the apocalyptic framework began to be dismissed uh, in the. It, in the second, third, fourth centuries, as that kind of parting of the ways happened, then you had a progressive kind of movement towards uh, the weed pulling and uh, seeking to kind of yeah. establish the justice and the day of God uh, by the hands of fallen men, so to speak. So, Amen. Yeah. Yeah. That's a yeah. good word. Don't be about yeah. weed pulling. Can, can we just That's say right. that again? That's right. Can we just not be about weed pulling? <laughs> that would be great. Amen. Maybe Let's God amen. loves. Maybe God loves it. the weeds and wants them to be saved from the fire. <laughs> Go figure. Yes, it's crazy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yes. Well, guys, let's uh, let's just hit some of these parables real quick. A little rapid fire round. These parables from Matthew and then a few from Luke as well. What about uh, the parable of the hidden treasure or the, the the pearl in the field, like Matthew thirteen? Well, I like uh, I, I like I think these are also really good kind of foundational because they also highlight how how clear this kind of anticipation of things being made right on the last day was, and so so many of the parables happen in context of people assuming that. God, well, even while this age spins out of control, so to speak, or it feels like it, that God will make things right one day and everybody will get what is due them. And so, like, there, there's a few few passages here that come to mind. Uh, fourth Ezra, uh, chapter 7, Do not be associated with those who have shown scorn, nor number yourself among those who are tormented. Kind of sounds like Psalm 1. But for you have a treasure of works laid up with the Most High, but it will not be shown to you until the last times. Also, Second Baruch, for the righteous justly have good hope for the end and go away from this habitation without fear because they possess with you a store of good works which is preserved in treasuries. Therefore, they leave this world without fear and are confident of the world which you have promised to them with an expectation full of joy. It's beautiful. Uh, that's Second Baruch 14 and Second Baruch 24, last one. For behold, the days are coming and the books will be opened in which are written the sins of all those who have sinned and moreover, all the treasuries in which are brought together the righteousness of all those who have proven themselves to be righteous. So the, the hidden, so like the... Uh, the hidden treasure and the pearl of great price, those things are just reiterating this common expectation. And I, no question that that's how the immediate audience would have understood it in, in terms of this eschatological reward. Yeah, I mean, Jesus is just just contrasting the Pharisees who they love this life, they love reputation, the praise of men, they love money, they, right. they have the show of loving God in the age to come, but it's it's hypocrisy. And so Jesus is just saying, you know, you're the wicked weeds that are growing up. You guys have bought in. You've you've sold yourself out to this age and this life. But uh, the kingdom of God is like him who knows the pearl or the treasure 
of eternal worth and sells everything in this age, lays down his life and to gain the treasuries that will be opened and the reward of the resurrection in the age to come. Yeah. Also, that reminds me of like the parable of the good and the bad fish, just a few verses later towards the end of Matthew 13, where the kingdom of heaven is said to be like a big net that's thrown out into the sea and gathered fish of every kind. But then when it was full, the fishermen brought it to shore and they started to find the good and keep it and then take the bad and throw the bad away. And Jesus explains again, it's going to be just like that at the end of the age. Again, beckoning the response, the division, um, and, and these same ideas of, uh, of Jewish apocalyptic all just comes to the forefront. Um, you also get a ton of other parables here in Matthew 13, but even more towards the end of Matthew as well, Matthew 18, the parable of the unforgiving servant, the landowner, yeah. um, the wicked tenants and the wedding banquet and the parable of the managers and then the virgins and the talents. I mean, so many, Matthew 24, 25, um, all the same sort of themes, right? Yeah, so, you know, particularly Matthew 24 and 25, the parables are given in light of the Olivet Discourse, and you have kind of the eschatological orientation of Matthew 24, and then he gives the parables of the managers, you know, the, the one responds rightly and and prepares food, the other doesn't respond and, and says, my master's a long time coming or whatever and starts to eat and drink and beat people. And the wise and foolish virgins, you know, some remain vigilant with their hopes set on the coming of, of the bridegroom, the day of God, the coming of the Messiah, the messianic banquet. Uh, and some don't and, and their lamps go out. You can't over analyze the particular features of the parables. The parables are simply parables of sobriety in Matthew 24 and 25 in a broad sense. And also the talents. He who continues to live out his life and his gifting and, and his resources for the age to come, for the day of God, and multiplies those things, then he'll receive reward at the judgment at the coming of the Messiah. And generally, all the parables have kind of this underlying theme of, you know, like you said, uh, Josh, the the parable of the unforgiving servant, if you don't forgive others in this age, you will not be forgiven. Your father at the judgment is the underlying assumption. There's also some of the parables that are uh, that are found only in Luke, like uh, the rich fool who, who becomes uh, wealthy in this age and decides the best thing to do is to build larger barns to store up for himself treasure in this age. So he's a fool. The barren fig tree, um, the the counting of costs, which is a really provoking one in Luke 14. They're all they're all just a they're all simply saying the same thing. They're proclaiming, they're reiterating what's to come. And and they're decrying and exposing a lack of response and just reiterating that a lack of response is going to inherit judgment from God. Like you hear these things and you're responding and, uh, and you have, you know, like the pearl of great price and you have eternal glory to anticipate, but you don't and you do have eternal judgment. And so a lot of the ones in Luke have, have well, I guess in both, in, 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 in all of the synoptics have kind of this sense of judgment attached to them as well. But some of these ones in Luke are actually really explicit and very easy to understand. Yeah, I, you guys know that I, I have a love-hate relationship with Luke 14. <laughs> That's been, for years, a painful chapter for me. And, uh, and the Lord has used it many times to say, <laughs> did did you really sign up for eternal life or what did you sign up for? What what did you say right. yes for? <laughs> it's like, yeah. well, I, I signed up to get my sanity back, I guess. I don't know. I don't. Anyway, so Luke 14, but then that leads into Luke 15 when Jesus is eating with the sinners and the Pharisees are grumbling and and uh, and Jesus tells the parables about the lost sheep, lost coin, and lost son, all of which exemplify God's heart for mercy to see those, you know, the, the sinners saved from the wrath to come, all three of which are have an undercurrent of polemics against the Pharisees because they don't have God's heart for mercy. And they're more like the elder son and, and they don't want to 
go searching for the lost sheep uh, within the house of Israel. And, uh, you know, Luke also has parables like uh, the shrewd manager, which can be difficult to understand. But again, just just want to reiterate, John mentioned it briefly, but just want to reiterate, if you want to understand the parables, like the last thing you want to do is get bogged down in the details. Yeah. Like everybody just kind of wants to plug all of the little details into some chart. And that's just not the point, especially the things that were such mundane life yep. for them. You know, they're they're meant to be de-emphasized, and people generally try to emphasize those things so that they can make a 24-part series out of the parable. But Insanity. <laughs> all he's saying in The Shrewd Manager, without reading the whole thing, is the, the, the moral of the story is the guy decides to live and use his resources for the time to come that he might have a reward in the time to come. So he he looks and sees his time is short, and so he decides to, instead of using the resources like he had, he uses his resources to love and to to share with people so that he might have eternal dwellings that are a better situation than his current dwelling. So it's just, that's the moral of the story. Like there's, you know, like 15 verses of details, but the, the original audience wouldn't have gotten lost in the details. Yeah, you know, so that's essentially you just you you, you take the take the punchline, and uh, that's that's what they would have walked away with generally. Yeah, the irony is that that parable is probably one of Jesus' most simple parables. Yeah, it's true. That the judgment's coming. Therefore, live wisely in light of the judgment that's yeah, coming. Right. But the the sons of this age are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than the sons of light. Yeah. And right. so, I mean. Uh, the parable is super straightforward and simple, uh, you know, a polemic against the Pharisees because he follows that right after with the Pharisees loved money. Yeah, right. they, they loved money and didn't love people. They weren't living to for eternal dwellings in the age to come. They weren't wise or shrewd. And But that parable in particular, it's so strange what, uh, what people yeah. do with it. Yeah. Well... The other one that I think of at the end of Luke, or towards the end of Luke, is in Luke 18, in the parable of the persistent widow. And, I mean, we know the story, right? So a widow is crying out for justice, and um, an unrighteous judge finally uh, gives in and says, okay, I'm going to give her what she wants. And the whole purpose, as Luke 18, 1 says, the whole purpose of this parable is to uh, encourage the disciples that they always ought to pray and to not lose heart. But oftentimes, this parable is disconnected from... Luke 17 and what Jesus said in Luke 17, which, uh, if we recall last week, we worked through this passage in Luke 17 about the coming of the kingdom and how Jesus is actually saying, you Pharisees aren't apocalyptic enough. Um, God alone is going to establish a kingdom by his strength alone on the day of Christ Jesus. And where this is going, uh, is there's going to be corpses and there's going to be a, a, a sudden like lightning flashing from the east to the west. This is how God is going to bring to pass um, the coming of his of the kingdom and and all of his promises that he made in the covenant. So this parable or this little story that Jesus gives about the persistent widow follows that as an encouragement to the disciples to say, hey, God isn't like the unjust judge. He is going to be faithful. He's going to do what he said, cry out to him in response to his certain promises so that you cannot lose heart, so that you would not give up in the face of adversity, knowing that the kingdom is actually coming. And and I don't know, I, I feel like this parable, like you said, Bill, you know, so many of the of the parables and the stories are mine for all of their little details to come up with your the the 24 part sermon series or or you know whatever. And I think that this one is. is I'm totally just, guilty of that, by the way. Well, but I, go on. <laughs> I, th I think I think we all are in some respects, right? And and uh, I think this one is just super simple to see in context to Luke 17 um, as an encouragement to his disciples that they always ought to pray to not give up in their confidence, because when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith? Will he find a, a, a group of people who are still confident in? his, uh, in, in the promises that he said that he would, he would establish. So yeah, another, another one, uh, just affirming the apocalyptic themes again, um, from Luke's gospel. So as we've seen guys, a lot of these are straightforward, but there are a couple that, uh, 
particularly two from Matthew 13 that are often used to support realized eschatology. And they're difficult ones for many. And it's the parable of the leaven and the parable of the mustard seed. Okay? And these two, I, I think that if we understand just the context behind them, if we understand the details as quoted in the Tanakh uh, and, and how these passages are just affirming all of the same things that all the rest of the parables are saying, I think they become a little bit easier to understand, right? So let's talk about this first one, the parable of the leaven from Matthew 13. Yeah, that, I think you bring up a good point, Josh. It really is just the the framework itself just allows these things. You just look at them, you tilt your head slightly, and you go, oh, it's so straightforward and plain. What what happened? And it's and it's not like you need a big hermeneutical tool you right. literally you just you just kind of get what everybody's talking about, and you're like, "Oh, how did how did how did I see that any differently?" That's really bizarre. And the leaven and the mustard seed are, are definitely a couple of those where generally people you know trip over themselves to explain the the growth and the invisible growth of the kingdom, and um, but it's 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 actually that's that's what is difficult to do with this text like just reading them the way we're saying is actually really easy to do like the leaven uh dodd dodd addressed the leaven in his parables of the kingdom and he said uh leaven in, is in general a symbol for evil influences carrying infection amen you should have you should have stopped there dodd yeah he yeah. did not <laughs> just in there exactly. just in there charles <laughs> just leave it there bro but instead, <laughs> he says, in this sense, Jesus used it when he spoke of the leaven of the Pharisees in, in Mark 8. By analogy, it should be used here as a symbol for a wholesome influence, propagating itself similarly, similarly by a kind of infection. In that case, we should be obliged to suppose that when the kingdom of God is compared to leaven, the suggestion is that the ministry of Jesus itself is such an influence. The picture, I think, is true to history. The ministry of Jesus was like that. There was in it no element of external coercion, but in it the power of God's kingdom worked from within, mightily permeating the dead lump of religious Judaism in his time. <laughs> See what he did there? That was... <laughs> oh, the old, oh, the old husk wow. of, of Judaism. Yeah. <laughs> kind of you had to stake that lump. in. <laughs> but, but, so, but so in reality, Levin maintains its same context, right? It's, it's, it's always something negative. It's yep. the thing you yep. take out of your bread before you're able to celebrate the Pesach, Passover. And, and it's a negative thing. And it's about sin and wickedness. And like so many of the parables, especially in in Matthew 13, Jesus is simply framing the rest of this age as an age where wickedness will continue to grow, yes. both because it presents an opportunity of repentance for the wicked and because it tests the righteous. Both are things that God is immensely interested with. Right. And, the, you know, the parables are generally spoken to unbelievers, and so... The flow of the parables has, especially in Matthew 13, has a generally negative uh, bent to them. And so this is the issue of both the leaven and the mustard seed is do you interpret them positively or negatively, fundamentally? Yeah. Not totally one way or the other, but what's the general bent of them? And so likewise, the mustard seed is given and he, you know, it's not a direct quote, but it's an allusion to Daniel 4, where he becomes a tree and the birds of the field and the air come and perch in its branches. And so, so nobody's going to hear an allusion to Nebuchadnezzar, the guy who destroyed the temple, as a positive thing, you know, right. and, and they're going to go, oh, so, you know, now you're the, the greater Nebuchadnezzar who's bringing in the, ushering in the hope of Israel, and it's just going to grow until it fills the whole world, the whole earth, you know. I, I'm pretty sure, pretty sure that nobody heard that parable in a positive fashion like that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, go back and read Daniel 4 and you'll see, yeah, especially if that's what Jesus was was alluding to. Well, and the other important point, John, is that 
both of these parables of the leaven and the mustard seed are couched between the telling and the interpretation of the parable of the wheat and the tares. Okay. And so if Jesus all of a sudden kind of shifted, you know, his, his perspective, um, from one, from, you know, something, uh, presumably negative and, and, you know, the, the tone is, is, hey, judgment's coming. There's going to be a division between the righteous and the wicked. And this age, the wickedness is going to be allowed to grow to its height. And then he goes and then he jumps into the parable of the leaven and he goes, oh, yeah, as Dodd said in, in the first part of his quote that we read there, leaven is a, sem- a symbol for evil influences carrying infection. Yes. <laughs> OK, so so what is Jesus simply or, or why does Matthew put that parable right there? Why does Jesus speak that parable? Because this is about evil growing, <laughs> right? right. And, and wickedness will reach its height. And then, you know, you get the mustard seed, the same sort of idea, um, pulling on Nebuchadnezzar. OK. And, and so, and then the explanation of the parable of the wheat and the tares coming directly after those parables to support and undergird exactly what he said in the parable of the wheat and the tares and the leaven and the mustard seed altogether. Yeah, I don't think I've ever heard a teaching or read a commentary that uh, makes the point that the mustard seed and leaven are told between the telling and interpreting of the wheat and the tares. I I think that's a huge point Right. that since Jesus doesn't interpret the mustard seed or leaven, we should really take the context of the wheat and the tares on either side of those two parables very seriously. And if if that parable, the wheat and the tares, is negative speaking about the fullness of wickedness coming to fruition – uh, before the day of God, then the mustard seed and leaven, I think it's a strong case that those should be interpreted along the same negative lines. And this is a, you know, this is a theme throughout scripture that uh, some people like Von Rad argue that it's the wisdom literature and the, and the wrestling with how, why do the wicked prosper and the righteous suffer that produced the apocalyptic movement in the second temple period? And so this theme of the, the fullness of wickedness and the growth of wickedness and God allowing the wicked to come to their fullness, uh, I think is a theme throughout the scriptures and the prophetic literature that then is really taken hold of in in apocalyptic thought and that this is really what Jesus is grabbing hold of in the parables, particularly in Matthew 13. Yeah. And not to, not to pick on, you know, these two parables, but, but they're, they're really kind of the, the pillars of anybody even daring to approach the other parables in a positive sense in Matthew 13. Mm -hmm. Like they're kind of done. It's kind of like circular, like it, it, they end up getting these two end up getting used to justify and and but they're just confusing because they don't actually mean anything if if that's like Jesus isn't saying anything to anybody and but so there, there you have to but but what I think we need to frame it as is you have to do a few things to really insist on a positive uh, realized eschatology in these two parables and. Uh, first of all, I mean you, you have to you have to use the framework that is that is very prevalent in uh, Jewish apocalyptic understanding, and you have to completely go against it without any notice, right? There, it's like kind of the rest of the kingdom teachings. You have to completely just come at it under the table without actually letting anyone know. You just got to sneak in the spiritualized imp- interpretation, which is. As a teacher, that's just like the craziest thing to do. Like, John, I th- you have in your book that one and, and a few others specifically in, in context to the mustard seed and the leaven. And so another one you mentioned is to go against the common apocalyptic theme of Jesus' own preaching, right? Not just apocalyptic understanding broadly, but the way Jesus frames things generally in his teaching. Um, yeah, he went from town to town preaching the kingdom of God is at hand. So it, right, that's right. the general... Uh-huh. And, and, and additionally, again, 
uh, the, the, the reasoning gets very circular related to these. And so the overall flow of chapter 13 is clearly apocalyptic. It's clearly um, highlighting and emphasizing and reminding about the day of judgment and the need for sobriety and the need for a response and humility and et cetera, et cetera, like some of the quotes we read earlier. And so these, these two really have to be an anomaly to the entire flow of the chapter. And even as John mentioned, flowing from chapter 12, the entire flow of the larger narrative where, where the, the hardness of heart is really being confronted but the 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 in some of the Pharisees who are you know Jesus he's casting out demons by demons and that whole thing. Uh, additionally, all of the adjacent passages, like uh, not not only largely the the chapter thirteen, but the wheat and the tares, like like Josh highlighted. And lastly, the um, the elements that are referenced in the parables are negative. They're both the leaven is always negative except for arguably here. That's what everybody says. Yeah, this is the exception, like, <laughs> like, like Dodd, like we just right. read. And, and uh, the reference in, in uh, what is most likely Daniel 4 and the reference to the mustard seed. So uh, everything just indicates that these things should be interpreted along the same lines of everything else in that flow from Matthew 12, Matthew 13, yeah. and onward. Yeah. that's good, guys. Well, so what? We've worked through... Uh, a lot of parables today. We've broken down the couple of problematic ones relating to the kingdom and Jesus's words about the kingdom and the leaven and the mustard seed. What's our response? How should we live um, in light of this? Man, um, I like that reminder that John gave from from Brother Pawson um, that this age is not about weed pulling. Mm. And uh, that it's uh, it's it's unfortunately characteristic of Western Christianity. It's bored Christianity, yeah. and uh, there's so much boredom that people actually are convinced that, like, it's part of their calling as a disciple of Jesus to give their lives to weed pulling. Mm. And it's crazy, and it drives people crazy when wickedness flourishes because they feel like called by God to take away all the weeds, to de- to uh, tear out all the weeds, and God's just not doing it. Yeah. And so I just, I just want to reemphasize that this age is not about weed pulling. That's right. Like it's not going to happen. And I think people, people, sometimes people legitimately have a heart for, for justice and righteousness to be established in, you know, in their community and, and awesome. But, but a lot of times what happens is people end up, um, they they feel the rub of the like the parable of the weed or the wheat and the and the tares. They feel the rub of of wickedness growing, and they join a justice movement because wickedness happens because wicked people have power, yep. right? And so when when wicked people have power, wickedness flourishes, and wickedness hurts righteous people. And so the idea of of weed pulling is a very personal one. It just because you feel it's going to touch you, the wickedness is going to touch you because it always comes around. Yep. So that's my that's my so what. That just a reminder: this age is not about weed pulling. God has ordained this age both as a witness to the wicked that He's extending mercy and patience to them, long suffering, and so we should do the same. And also, this is how God tests and proves and authenticates our faith. And, uh, and, and this is how He treats us, like Hebrews 12 is a good father. He allows wickedness to grow, to discipline His own children so that, so that they might inherit eternal glory. So that's my so what. Amen. Yeah, my so what's the same. Don't weed pull. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's good. It, it really, you know, it comes to climax in the Crusades when you paint a cross on your shield so that you can, you know, exact, exact the justice of God on the infidel. And it, yeah. it's, it's kind of right. the ultimate yep. loss of the apocalyptic framework that God is going to radically reverse the wickedness of this age. And it's God who is allowing the wicked to flourish because it's God who loves the wicked. 
And it's God who wants to see the wicked repent and be saved, even the Antichrist himself. Um, you know, that what is the response to the coming Antichrist is to preach the cross and yeah. repent and flee the Amen. wrath to come. That's the response to a coming global Antichrist. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Amen. and this reminds me of, you know, something I had mentioned earlier, Luke 18 and the parable of the persistent widow. And, you know, if because this age is not about weed pulling, um, because this age is not about tearing down wickedness now and crusading now and establishing righteousness now, um, Jesus gives this parable to persevere in prayer because God alone is going to establish the kingdom of righteousness on the day of the Lord. Amen. He's going to send his Messiah. He's going to crush the wicked. He's going to reward the righteous. That day is coming. It is certain. It is clear. It, it is a real day in our future. And because he loves the wicked in this age and wants them to repent, our job is not to pull the weeds. Our job is not to, uh, to, to try to remove the weeds now, but to bear witness through patience and perseverance. And the whole point of the parable, you know, as I had mentioned before, is that, that Jesus is encouraging his disciples, don't give up on yeah. actually counting God as reliable, that that day really is coming. He really will uh, gather the wheat into his barn and burn the chaff with unquenchable fire. Um, so a sobriety should fill us. Uh, I'm, I feel like, uh, you know, this is kind of a, so what that we have almost every single week is, is may we be sober. Um, and I think that this is the thrust of all of the material we've been looking at in this podcast is, is the response should be sobriety, perseverance, endurance, um, boldness in yeah. preaching and, and proclaiming this message, um, yeah. because the God of Israel really will do everything that he's promised. That's so. right. Amen, Amen, guys. Amen. Well, it's been great to be with you today. Um, listeners, we hope you've been provoked and encouraged. Um, next time, we want to do something a little different. Um, we'll, we're going to take a quick little diversion from our series here on the kingdom, and we want to talk about the Magnificat from Mary. We, we want to do a little bit of a uh, little bit of a pre-Christmas and an Advent episode for you all, and we want to work through. The Jewish apocalyptic messianic Christmas. <laughs> make Christmas great again. <laughs> and link all of these themes mm -hmm. and ideas. We, we want to make Christmas great again. We hope you join us <laughs> right. for that next time. Thanks for listening to the Apocalyptic Gospel Podcast. God bless and Maranatha. Maranatha. Thanks for listening to the Apocalyptic Gospel Podcast. For more, visit us on our website at apocalypticgospel.com and follow us on Twitter at Apocalyptic Gospel.